Let me just say by way of um, freelance before I formally introduce Piers that I'm of a generation when the idea that Toronto would be one of the places mentioned in the same sentence as Cannes for film excellence in the world would have caused people to laugh out loud. Um, it really is an extraordinary achievement of several of the people at the head table here and all of those who work for them that the Toronto International Film Festival is now one of the preeminent film festivals in the world. It actually makes me um, a little astonished to say that. And I can remember when Bill and his friends created the original festival, there were many people who were quite skeptical that this would turn into something of significance. And as I think you're going to hear from peers today, it's got even greater growth plans ahead. Pierce Handling is the director and the chief executive officer of TIFF. He's held the position since 1994. He's responsible for leading both the operational and artistic growth of the organization. TIFF has a $33 million annual operating budget and employs more than 150 full-time staff. Under Handling's direction, the organization has grown to become an internationally renowned cultural institution. In 2010, TIFF, TIFF opened its own permanent home, which presents daily programming. The TIFF Bell Lightbox houses five cinemas, two galleries, and education and learning studios. And it is, I think, the most magnificent collection of cinemas in the world. If you have not been to a movie there, you're doing yourself an injustice. Handling has curated numerous film retrospectives and presented programs of Canadian cinema at Sundance, the British Film Institute, the Havana Film Festival, and sat on festival juries in Cannes, Tokyo, Rotterdam, Torino, and Istanbul. Prior to joining TIFF, Hanley began his career at the Canadian Film Institute, becoming deputy director. Leaving CFI, he taught Canadian cinema at Carleton and at Queen's in Kingston. He's published extensively on Canadian cinema. Hanley has been honored with the Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres, France's highest cultural insignia. In 2003, he was named CEO of the Year by the Canadian Public Relations Society. He holds honorary doctorates from Ryerson, York, and OCAD, and sits on a number of boards and advisory councils. Pierce, this podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank Robin and the Empire Club for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it really is a big honor, and thank you all for coming. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, RBC and E1. Um, thank you so much for sponsoring today. Mem many of our board members are here today. Thank you for, for coming out. Friends from the community, I see a number of filmmaker friends who are here, and this illustrious head table. You have three directors or former directors of the Toronto International Film Festival and my co-partner in crime, Michelle Mayhew, on the head table as well. So Bill and Helga ran this festival so successfully before I took over. So um, how many of you have done your Oscar polls yet? <laughs> Argo. Uh, looks like Argo is going to sneak in and actually win the Best Picture Oscar, uh, which is going to surprise all of us. It's kind of the dark horse. And where did you actually see Argo for the first time? Believe it or not, you saw it here in Toronto, the Toronto International Film Festival. We had the world premiere. So it's lovely to see a film like that go into the marketplace and do so well. And I think it's been a big surprise. At the same time, there's two Canadians who are nominated for Oscars. Kim Nuygen, Rebel Warwitch, Michael Dana for original score for The Life of Pi. And I want to wish both of them a huge, huge, you know, good luck, pat on the back. And I also want to note that these are two Canadians who are playing on the international stage. And that actually fits right into, ties into the remarks that I want to make today. Now, over the past 37 years, the Toronto Film Festival screened thousands of movies from scores of countries for millions of people. Every single one of these films featured a trailer, a sneak preview of what was in that film. Now, today I want to offer you our trailer, a little sneak peek, a little sneak preview of coming attractions at TIFF. Indeed, our beginnings were right out of a movie. Back in 1976, as Bill will remember, we were so small and shaky that year one was financed by his credit card. <laughs> and in the early days, our bank loans were secured by the personal guarantees of our board members. Thank you, Martin Connell, our first chair. We are all in your debt. Now, fast forward to today. TIFF is not only one of the largest public film festivals in the world, it's one of the most important and respected film institutions anywhere. We employ 170 full-time staff. 
have 2,200 volunteers. We partner with all levels of government, with hundreds of corporations and foundations, and legions of individual supporters, many of whom are in this room. Through the course of the year, we screen literally thousands of films, from Hollywood galas to Canadian premieres to international spotlights on regions like Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Our annual budget, which was about a quarter of a million dollars when Bill started it, is now almost $40 million today. It's grown, Robin, in the last year, from the figure you mentioned to $40 million. Our economic impact on the city is even bigger, some $170 million a year, and it's growing. In 2010, as Robin mentioned, we opened our own building, an ambitious dream which was funded by a capital campaign that saw us raise $196 million for Tiff Bell Lightbox, for the, for the uh, building itself, and an endowment, and for transitional uh, operating costs. Today, Tiff Bell Lightbox is only one of four centers in the world that's dedicated just to film. In three years, we've engaged many, many new audiences in the building and introduced them to the past, to the present, and the future of film creating bridges of understanding between different communities while providing a window on the world. And let's not forget what Tiff Bell Lightbox has done to the local neighborhood. King and John has now enlivened that, that downtown neighborhood and spotlighted the city also around the world. But now that we're 37 years old and we've got a roof over our heads, we actually want to leave home, or rather we want to take on the world from our home. Today I want to tell you about the next stage in our quest, the next act in our own movie. Until today, TIFF was largely about the world coming to us here in Toronto. And tomorrow, our vision revolves around taking TIFF to the world. Until today, we were mainly recognized for our 11-day film festival. Coupled with our growing year-round initiatives housed under the roof of TIFF Bell Lightbox, tomorrow, our vision is to bundle all of these incredible things and to be the global center for film culture. We've never been shy about inviting the world to Toronto for the film festival. Tomorrow, we will go out into the world and take parts of Toronto with us. We want to create a global community of film lovers. The TIFF brand will now be recognized everywhere. We're not alone. Leaders from every part of Canada's economy are saying that we have to play in the international arena if we're to hope to survive here at home. For TIFF, moving on to the global stage is part of a natural process that has seen us grow from a 10-day festival to a 365-day feast, and from a local event into a global one. This reality really just mirrors what's going on in our own film industry. Let's look at three of Canada's most important films over the last couple of years, Incendie, Cairo Time, and Rebel. I should also mention Midnight's Children. All of them were shot in the Middle East, Africa, and India. All are relentlessly international in their subject matter. Last year, I visited the major museums of the world and talked to their CEOs. I went to Tate Modern. I went to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Pompidou Center in uh, Paris. And all of them were very thoughtfully grappling with a global agenda, and certainly with an agenda that went beyond the city in which they were based. When I asked one of the CEOs what part of his vision did the, that, that board respond to in his job interview, he paused for a second and then quoted Helmut Schmidt, the former Chancellor of West Germany, people who have visions should go and see a doctor. <laughs> it was an interesting comment. I actually paused and I thought about, you know, the whole vision thing. And while I see his point, I do think you actually need to have a dream of where you want to take your organization, of where you want to be in the future. Now, The Economist magazine has stated that Toronto is one of the top five livable cities in the world. Three of these top cities are Canadian. So what are we waiting for? You walk into Indigo and you see it there on the wall, the world needs more Canada. So TIFF's vision of going global will form the strategic framework for the next logical step in our development. Frankly, I see it as an inevitable step that will secure our future. So I just want you to indulge me for the next 10 minutes or so as I walk through some of the things here. I want you to be the test audience for the trailer of our film and our vision of being a world leader in enriching how people everywhere experience films. When I'm done, I'd like to get your reaction. What did you like about the film? What do you think we should change? 
and how can we make it better? Some people thought that TIF Bell Lightbox was actually overreaching when we announced our plans, but we believed that for TIF to grow, we had to move beyond our most successful franchise, the 11-day September Film Festival. To remain competitive, to achieve significant impact locally, internationally, and, interna and, and globally, we had to seriously develop year-round programming, and that programming demanded a home if it was to be noticed. Every major film festival in the world is now involved in some form of annual ongoing programming. Those that don't risk falling behind. So TIFF Bell Lightbox was a major step forward. We grew horizontally across the calendar, vertically via year-round screenings, tours and exhibitions, and virtually via more digital activities. Surely that was ambition enough, and yes, we've succeeded in doing all that in just three years. But I have to confess there were many times, as we saw the world of entertainment going virtual, that we thought to ourselves, was the building a mistake? Was it a 20th century idea at a time when the 21st century is dispensing with bricks and mortar? Thankfully, our doubts were wrong. If anything, I think the building has liberated us and given us critical mass. By bringing all of our activities under one roof, cinemas with exhibition, learning, retail, and restaurant spaces, we saw for the first time the power of collected creativity. We looked around at Mars and at CAMH and kind of saw ourselves in their success. So when the credits roll on our global initiative, one of the most important will actually be our building. It was there that we began to map out our key global initiatives and priorities. And we're now working on the realities of trying to make these come true. So how does one go global in the arts world? We're currently engaged in two incredibly exciting ventures. This June, TIFF will launch a truly global initiative. Curated by Noah Cowan, the artistic director of TIFF Bell Lightbox, a century of Chinese cinema will offer Toronto an unprecedented 70-plus film retrospective of Chinese films from the 1920s to today, accompanied by a major new gallery show of Chinese visual art and our first ever ebook. Many of these films will be shown outside of China for the very first time in newly stuck prints and digital restorations. Films that none of us have ever seen will be taken out into the world for the first time. I think this is really going to be a seminal moment in film history. I'm incredibly excited. I have not seen many of these films. TIFF has led the way on this initiative. Our long relationship with China, built up over many years during the film festival, has resulted in this collaboration, all due to the fact that now we have a building in which to show these important films. Over the years, we've become pretty expert at partnering. We play well with others, and being Canadian, we've obviously had to do this in order to grow. And sometimes to partner, you also have to work small miracles. This show came about because we spent time fostering conditions which allowed for the first ever collaboration between the China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong film archives. The film program has stirred significant international attention. It will tour to the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the British Film Institute in London, and hopefully other places as well. The gallery show will also tour first to the Australian Centre of the Moving Image in Melbourne, Australia, and then to leading art institutions around the world. It will include a major new commission from leading Shanghai-based artist Yang Fudong and a series of video collages by the crazy Australian Chinese cinematographer Chris Doyle. Our China show is about showcasing the treasures of international cinema. Now what about showing Canada to the world? So our second major initiative. This October, TIFF will launch a massive David Cronenberg show. This project, focusing on the legacy of Can English Canada's most revered and famous director, is multifaceted. We're actually mounting two exhibitions. The first is going to focus on David's films, props, costumes, special effects, photos, never seen before audio, vi audio visual material, restaged sets, and fascinating documentation of his filmmaking process. The second part of this massive project, we've collaborated with MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art here in Toronto, to commission multiple new international artworks by leading artists inspired by Cronenberg's films. 
will also present a retrospective of his films with actors and collaborators in attendance at the screenings. As well, we are creating an experiential virtual museum, an interactive game, and publishing two books. All this will open at Tiff Bell Lightbox on November 1st this year and run for three months. We will then send this show out on the road, as we are doing for the Century of, China, of Chinese Cinema program. We're currently in discussions for the Cronenberg Show to tour to major international venues in Paris, London, Frankfurt, and Melbourne. Our other programming is also attracting international partners. We started our annual Canada's Top 10 Showcase in 2003, and currently it tours across the country. We've been approached by cities in Asia and Europe to take Canada's Top 10 global. Why not? There are many other initiatives of ours that can make the jump from the local and the national to the international. For years, our Cinematech has led the world in groundbreaking programs of historic Japanese, Asian, and European cinema. We've run one of the world's most successful children's film festivals, TIFF Kids, since 1998. Our nationwide award-winning and highly innovative film circuit which takes Canadian, foreign language, and independent films into almost 200 communities across country, is a model that has been studied around the world. We're leaders in community-based and educational programs. Special Delivery brings films and their directors at no cost to youth in underserved communities. TIFF's Pocket Fund helps kids from local schools, shelters, and community groups enjoy international films, learn about cultures from around the world, meet filmmakers, and participate in interactive film workshops. Real Comfort reaches out to patients in the mental health and psychiatric units at Toronto General Hospital and St. Michael's Hospital. As you can see, for the past 27, or 37 years, we've been honing our expertise in curating films and articulating their meaning and their importance. It's now time to take this expertise out into the world. These ongoing local and national initiatives could well join Cronenberg and China in the international arena. In 2012, more than two million unique visitors logged on to TIFF.net to learn about our films and programs. But since the appetite for films and commentary on them seems infinite, and since TIFF's reputation for credible, objective, in-depth knowledge has never been higher, we believe we can insert ourselves into the epicenter of the millions of conversations held around movies on a daily basis. That dialogue will clearly take place online. And no world is changing faster or more profoundly than this virtual world. We don't know what it's gonna be like 10 years from now, but the one thing we do know is that the internet will continue to wrench us from our comfortable pews. We not only have a right to be in that conversation, we believe we have an obligation to lead it. Since our second, hence our second major initiative, digital extension, we want to ensure that the digital world is intertwined virtually with everything we do. Like every other organization, we want to expand our online community. Today, ours numbers more than 100,000 members and friends. We're now asking ourselves, how do we reach out to many, many more people and create a rich and relevant conversation around film and the moving image and how do we intervene to create meaningful impact? It's a big question that everyone's trying to deal with these days. And we cannot afford to simply stand by and watch as others enter this field. Creating a global online community that will become a destination for cinephiles and new film aficionados is a challenge that we're eager to take on. But whatever the technology or the platform, what's pretty clear is that to go global in a meaningful and a sustainable way, our staff will have to mirror our aspirations. Not only will we have to travel to meet our partners, we'll also have to have a, a staff that is global, is as global as our aspirations. Language skills and international expertise will be factors that will come into play in our future. And finally, we will have to be nimble and flexible in creating new global partnerships. Let me repeat that we Canadians are very good at this because we have to be. With 2.8% of the world's GDP and less than half a percent of its population, we have to make allies beyond our borders in order to grow. Fortunately, I think TIFF can capitalize on its particular strengths as well as its patriotic ones. 
For well over three decades, we have grown in size, budget, and renown because of the dozens, nay, hundreds of partnerships we've created with corporations, other film organizations, other nations, including that of China, whose Deputy Consul General, Meifeng Zhang, is here with us today. But we can also capitalize on something else, a quality epitomized by this city that we live in. It's what we're celebrated for, what our politicians and economists and the international media trumpet is our unique civic and national strength, our lasting advantage. And that, of course, is our diversity. Until today, TIFF was all about the world coming to us. Well, the city of Toronto is all about the world coming to us as well. But it's time for both of us to take our defining differences and share it with the world. It's been said that sweet are the uses of diversity. And nowhere is this potential as great as it is here right now in Toronto. Our city and our festival epitomize the view that, it's our, that it is our differences that unite us. In taking on the world, I think we've made the biggest decision in our lives. The building was easy. But we can't make it happen on our own. We will need your help. We will need the help of others far beyond this room and this country. But I have a strong feeling that many of you here share our view that the future of Canada lies beyond Canada, that our best tomorrows will start their days very far away. We want to dream big. Bill and Hank and Dusty did when they started the Festival of Festivals in 1976. We did when we took on the task of raising $196 million for TIFF Bell Lightbox. We can't afford to sit on our laurels. The future beckons, and we'd better be there. So if you like our vision, if the sneak peek that we've provided you today actually makes you want to see the entire movie, I invite you to join with us in making this Canadian film a global hit. Thank you very much. Mr. President, distinguished guests and fellow members of the Empire Club, I have the honor to uh, thank our guest speaker, Mr. Piers Handling. And uh, I've had the honor of knowing Piers for the past uh, five years or so only. But I can certainly attest to the fact that his leadership in making TIFF the world-class organization that it is, both during the annual FIM Festival and now throughout the year, has been outstanding. As a sponsor of today's lunch and a major partner to TIFF, I would like to thank you, Piers, for being uh, such a great visionary, despite what uh, Helmut said, and for transforming the way people see the world through film. And we are certainly looking forward to seeing how taking TIFF global uh, brings uh, uh, TIFF to the world and uh, the wonderful things that that will uh, bring to our country and to our city. So on behalf of everyone here today, I'd like to thank you for entertaining us, informing us. I think we would like to nominate that film for an Oscar. <laughs> and uh, thank you for putting Toronto on the world stage. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Pierce has kindly agreed to take a few questions, and we have a microphone at the back of the room here. Who wants to be first? I'll ask a question. Please. Mr. Handling, thank you very much for your fascinating vision. Um, going forward, what would be your projected budget and governments have limited capability to assist? It's a really good question. Um, our budget has grown so much, it's actually doubled in the last two years since we opened our building. We moved into the building with about a $20 million budget, it's now $40 million. I think to realize a dream like this, and it's not necessarily just a five-year dream, I think this is a long-term dream, maybe achievable in 10, 15 years. Um, hard to put a budget on it. We're starting to dream, we, we do a lot of budgeting, what we call left to right, you just sort of build it incrementally, we've been very successful at that. We're now starting to do some right to left budgeting, saying, to achieve this, what does it look like? Is it 70 million, 80 million, 90 million dollars? So we're in that process right now. But I think that uh, the second part of your question around government funding, we're not going to be looking to governments, to be honest. I think we're going to have to look to international partners. So many of our major sponsors now um, are international, L'Oreal, Audi, um, RBC. So we will be looking to 
global partners to realize a vision like this. I think those corporations are all looking to extend their good works, not just within the country that they're operating, but also many of the other countries that they're operating in. So donors, I think there's the potential for donors, international donors, uh, for the major arts institutions and major film organizations to go to them and galvanize them. There's not too many organizations that we're competing with in the film arena. So we think that with our vision and our reputation, um, hopefully we'll be able to raise the money as we did for TIFF Bell Lightbox. Questions over here? We have another microphone on this side of the room. I'll ask a question. What is TIFF's biggest competition? What do you look at with anxiety or dread? God. It's funny, I never really think that way. I actually look more for opportunities than threats. Because um, I think this digital universe, people have often seen it as a threat. And I see it actually as a huge opportunity, always have. Um, I think people will continue to go to cinemas for a variety of reasons. And the fact that there the, is so much material that's now available to them will only actually make them want to go and see, continue to actually go into cinemas. Um, they'll become better educated viewers, They're more demand for the kinds of things that we're doing. So um, I honestly don't see threats. I see other partnerships. I, th I think I see TIFF partnering with other film institutions. I mean, Sundance is doing, is thinking globally as we are, um, doing a lot of really good work in very different ways. Um, Tribeca is doing global things as well. And I think some of the museums that I, the, the research I did last year talking to some of the museums, um, I think there's potential partnerships is there as well because we're running institutions. There's a complete blend now between, uh, or the beginning of a blend between visual arts, um, film, moving image arts. A lot of the, the strict barriers are breaking down and I think that you're seeing film in museums and you're seeing museum work and installation work in film institutions and film festivals. So I think there's immense opportunity actually. I don't see too many threats out there. But I'm a complete Last optimist. Chance. So we have one question here. I guess um, with the success we've seen in Toronto of bringing youth into the um, Toronto International Film Festival, with the Next Wave Festival that happened over the weekend, what are you guys planning on doing? I guess with the international community of youth in film. What are we? Sorry, the last bit of your question I missed. The bringing in youth internationally with TIFF with your expansion. Bringing in youth yeah. internationally. So it's a good question. Maybe a lot of people don't know that we split our children's film festival into two, and we've just completed our very successful Next Wave Festival, which is really a te the teen part of it, and then there's the under 13 part of it, which is TIFF Kids. Um, it's a really good question, and I think we're at ver the very preliminary stage in terms of how we engage with these particular audiences, and of course every institution wants to, especially the teen audience. Um, in my research last year, it was fascinating to talk to the heads of museums in terms of what they were doing for children, for families, for teens, for adults. Some of them interestingly, weren't doing a lot. But I think what they did want to focus on was the teen market, because they saw that as their future. Um, we've made some baby steps. It's just the second year of our Next Wave Festival. It's become more successful. Um, I think that through mentoring programs, I think that's really, really important. I think a lot of people want hands-on experience. While we're not a training institution, I think that we are a mentoring institution, and we can actually provide access to a lot of film expertise, a lot of film artists. Um, so I think that's probably what we would build on, the, the connections to the film industry, to film artists, some of whom are in this room, that type of access to those people, so mentoring opportunities for teens. In some cases, of course, they're actually making films, and we're showing these films. Um, we, we do have, in both our Children's Festival and in Next Wave, a, a production section. So I think it's just fostering and helping those people into the next stage of development which is to move on to organizations like the Canadian Film Center, universities and colleges, et cetera, et cetera. Last chance. One more question anywhere? Okay, thank you very much, Pierce. Thank you for being such a great audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. As a token of our appreciation, may I present you with a copy of Who Said That? a selection of the best of the speeches to the Empire Club over the last hundred years, and you will appear in a future volume. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, each one of you should have had at your seats a list of upcoming events, and I'm pleased to let you know we have a great lineup of speakers coming for you. On Tuesday, March the 5th next week, those of you who care about casinos will have an opportunity to come and cheer or hiss. 
Councillor Adam Vaughan and Sandy Garasino, co-founder of Vancouver Not Vegas, will launch our discussion of the casino debate here in this room in the Arcadian Court. On, Tuesday, on Thursday next, rather, um, the Prime Minister of France will be here, Jean-Marc Ayrault, and that will be in the concert hall of the Royal York. I'd like again to thank RBC for sponsoring our event, thanks to Entertainment One for sponsoring the VIP reception, and thank you very much to Brendan Calder and my friend Helen Burston for thanking our student tables. I'd like to thank the National Post as our print sponsor, Rogers TV, who carries us, and we're very grateful for their support. We're on Twitter and Facebook and at empireclub.org. Thank you all very much for coming. This meeting is adjourned.